Praise the Lord. I am Michael Thomas Sambo, the General Coordinator of the Global Revival of Holiness Ministry, a non-denominational ministry in Abuja, Nigeria. I'm here to share with you the, my testimony of my encounter and trip to heaven and hell with Jesus. I became a Christian at the age of 13. I was born again. And after that, I consistently and humbly served the Lord. Until the year 2003, I had an encounter with Jesus. So I'm here this evening to present to you the full detail of that testimony of what happened to me when I died in 2003 in a camp meeting of young people in Nigeria. I died and the Lord came to me in that camp and took me to heaven and took me to hell and have sent me back to the world to testify to mankind of his everlasting love so that man can have everlasting life. In the year 2003, we were all praying for God's visitation. I didn't know uh, the visitation was going to be my eventual death in the campground. We assembled some few young people and were praying before the camp meeting began. Over there in Nigeria, in Taraba State, in Takun local government. And we waited on the Lord in prayers and fastings until the day the meeting began. The meeting started on Wednesday. But because of the way we have prayed and sought the face of God, God has given us assurance that he was going to visit our camp. So when the meeting started on Wednesday, we were having a high expectation of God's visitation. Eventually, by Thursday, Friday, on Friday night, I had not seen any special move of God because I was the camp commandant of the meeting. I was the one in charge of all the various sections of the retreat, of the program, of the camp meeting. This camp was having about 500 young people in attendance, comprising of students from secondary school, that's high school, and apprentices, and students from the university and polytechnics and colleges of education. On the Friday night, I went to the youth pastor to ask him questions. I was concerned that God promised to visit us and up to now, we haven't seen any special move and visitation of God. So he saw the burden I came with to see him and he said, I should not worry. God is going to visit us tomorrow being the last full day of the camp. That's the final day, the last day of the camp. God is going to visit us. And so we prayed together that night. I retired back to my hostel. And when I got to my hostel, I was studying the Bible because I decided to have my devotion at that time. I came to Isaiah chapter 59 verse 20. The scripture says, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, said the Lord. After I read this scripture, the Lord arrested my attention and began to minister to me in a very powerful way. The Spirit of the Lord ministered to me that tomorrow he shall be visiting our camp. So I didn't know what God wanted to do, maybe a kind of miracle or whatsoever, but we meditated on that scripture. I prayed on it. When I woke up very early in the morning to prepare myself to get to the camp, because I had instructed the prayer warriors to assemble by 6 a.m. so that we can pray before the camp meeting begins. began. Eventually, I got to the camp by 6 a.m. and I met all the prayer warriors already praying. They were really, really praying. So when I got in there, I stopped the prayer and I announced to them, I said, last night and this morning, the Lord spoke to me that he is going to visit our camp. So we should get ourselves ready for God's visitation. Even at this time, I still didn't know what God was going to do, a miracle or a kind of visitation, I didn't know. I stopped the prayer and announced to them of the visitation of God, which God has spoken to me. And 
We sang a song, he's alive, amen, he's alive. Jesus is alive forever, he's alive, amen. We sang that song for about an hour. Then at seven o'clock, we got ourselves into the camp and we began the meeting proper. Now, quite some hours after, my youth pastor came to me and said, he wants to give me an assignment. And we sat on the veranda of the hall of the meeting and he gave me the assignment. While he was giving me that assignment, suddenly I saw heaven opened. I saw two, three persons descended from heaven. I counted them, they were three. But the man at the left hand side and the one at the right hand side, they were all angels. But the man at the middle was shining like sun in his full strength. I made several efforts to look at it face to face. I was unable because of the intensity and the brightness of his glory. They all walked up to me and out of that embodiment of that light, an arm shot out and I received that hand and the voice followed and said, I am Jesus Christ. I am he that was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. I have come from heaven to take you to heaven to show you the glory of my kingdom in response to your request. So I dropped all my belongings, my Bible, my file, my writing materials, my everything. I stood up, left the youth pastor, seated on the seat, and I followed him. He led me out of the camp to the room where we played in the morning. But while going away from the camp, I look at my right hand, because I was still afraid. I look at my right hand side, I saw a very close friend of mine. I beckoned at him to follow me. So his name is Brother Hassan. He followed me to the classroom where we prayed in the morning, not knowing I was with three other persons, divine visitors to the camp of the meeting, to the youth revival program. So when we got into that classroom, I prostrated before the Lord and he said to me, I am Jesus Christ. I am he that was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. I have come to take you to heaven. You may come back, you may not come back. But in case you don't come back, tell this your friend to tell your youth pastor certain things which I told him. And then I turned to my friend, I said, the Lord just spoke to me, he's taking me to heaven. He screamed and shouted. He was in a shock. And he was telling me, no, you are too young to die. You can't die now. And I said to him, the Lord said, he's standing right now beside us. He said, he's taking me to heaven. My friend, take good care of your Christian life. And I wave at him. I say, bye till we meet again. After that point, quite some minutes later, I saw that my spirit had come out of the body. I saw my body lying on the floor. And my friend that came in with me into that classroom was screaming and turning the body upside down shouting my name and praying. Meanwhile, my spirit had come out of the body. As I stood beside my body, I tried to talk to him. I discovered he wasn't hearing me. I tried to communicate with him. I discovered he wasn't seeing me. So while I was wondering what has happened to me, suddenly a voice spoke to my heart deep within me and said, Mike, you have died. At this point, I came to total realization that I was no longer alive. Some minutes later, I discovered I was already giving my body some distance. We were already ascending up to the sky. So I kept looking back at the body. The more I look at the body, the more distance I gave the body. We got to a point in the sky, the Lord Jesus turned to me and said to me, what are you looking at the back? I said, I'm looking at my body. He said, I should forget about that flesh, that that is the flesh, and that is what has made many people not to serve him. And then we continued our journey to heaven. We got to a point in the sky, I look and I saw brightness. I haven't seen that kind of brightness before. I saw light. Then, in excitement, because 
My two hands were on the shoulder, were resting on the shoulder of Jesus. He was carrying me to heaven. One angel by the right, one angel by the left. So in excitement, I tapped his shoulder. I said, Lord, there's something I'm beholding afar of. What is that thing I'm beholding afar of? The Lord turned to, to me and said, Mike, that is heaven. That is the place I have prepared for all the people that love me from the foundation of the world. Don't worry, we shall soon get there. Suddenly, as she finished saying this, we arrived at the pearly gates of heaven. My friend, heaven is a beautiful place. Now, this experience took place three consecutive times. This first one took place for about five hours. We got to heaven. The Lord took me to heaven. The Lord took me to hell and came back with me to the gates of heaven and instructed the angels and said, take him and show him the way he will follow back to the world. As Jesus instructed the angels to show me the way back to the world, they brought me to a point and pointed their finger and said, if you follow this road, you will go to the earth and turn back and we went back to heaven. So I grabbed one of them and I said, I've been to heaven. I've seen the glory of God. It's a place to be. I don't want to go back to the world. I've seen the glory of God. I've seen the majesty of God. I've seen the beauty of heaven. I've seen how beautiful angels are. So. For me, the world is a dirty place, the world is vanity, I didn't want to go back to the world, so I grabbed the angels, and uh, as I grabbed the angel, the angel pushed me away from him, and then I came back to life. When I came back to life, I heard voices of people surrounding me who were praying for my dead body, for my recovery from death. But my eyes were open, I wasn't seeing anything. Then I suddenly requested for a pen and paper, and I began to write, although I didn't know what I was writing. But after I recovered from the whole experience, I saw the paper I was writing, I was writing truth, righteousness, and holiness. Because these were the words Jesus emphasized to me in heaven. He emphasized them to me in heaven, he emphasized them to me in hell, and he has given me the mandate to preach truth, righteousness, and holiness. And that is why I am doing here today. Now, eventually, as I came back to the world, my eyes were open. I wasn't seeing anything because of the intensity of the light and the glory of the majesty of God. Eventually, while they surrounded me and they were pouring water on my body to recover, the two angels came back again. In the presence of the people praying for me, about 20 of them, so I started shouting, I said, see angels, see angels. See angels, they have come for me again. And the people were asking me, where are the angels? I, we can't see them. I said, see, can, can't you see the two angels? And then the angels said, the Lord Jesus Christ sent them to me to say that they should take me back to the heaven. Right before their very eyes, I fell down and I died again. This time I spent, according to the testimony of the people that prayed for me. We spent 8 hours 15 minutes. The angels took me in the speed of light into the sky. We got to a point in the sky, suddenly they disappeared. I didn't see them again. I looked left, I looked right, I saw nobody. I turned, I didn't see anything, I didn't see any tree. I was left in an open space, only with firmament and the skies and clouds. Just like when you fly in the aeroplane, you get to a point in the sky, you, saw, you see nothing, you only see the space and the firmament. So I had a question to ask, but nobody was there to ask to answer my question. I wanted to say something. There's something in my mind I wanted to say, but there's nobody to ask. So. And, and I was in a stationary position. But after a little while, suddenly, a force pushed me from my position to another position. When I got to that new position, and I saw a road. And then there was a force that was pulling me. That force was pulling me on that road. I was walking so fast as if I want to get to my destination so fast. Suddenly, 
when I look back, I saw that a long queue of people queuing up behind me. Who are these people? These people I saw were those who have died and have joined the journey to eternity, a journey of no return. And every one of us will go through this. It doesn't matter what you claim you believe. It doesn't matter what you think you have. But one day you're going to leave this world. You will join and undertake that journey of no return. Now, while we were walking on that queue, I met seven people before me when we got eventually to the pearly gates of heaven. I met seven people. And out of seven people, only one person made it to heaven. At the pearly gates of heaven, I met two gigantic angels. In the book of Revelation, the scriptures of truth, Revelation chapter 20, in verse 11, and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell deliver of the dead which were in them, and they will judge every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. At the judgment gate, I saw a mighty book before them. They will touch that book, and the book will open on its own accord. As the angel looks at that book, if your name is not found written in the book, the moment he takes his eyes off the book and his eyes hit your face, standing before the angel, this is final judgment. A mighty force will come and take you off your feet and I fixed my eyes on that man and that mighty force took that man to the, into the body of fire and that was hell. Friends, this is reality and this is the moment of truth. Now, I've shared with you two episodes. The first time I went to heaven, Jesus took me to heaven, he took me to hell. The second time, that first time was about five hours. The second time, the angels came back and took me in the midst of the people who were praying for my dead body. That I was told we spent eight hours, 15 minutes, and I returned back to life. Now, what happened at the gate of heaven? At the judgment gate, I saw a brother who died and was coming towards the judgment gate. When he got to the judgment gate, he saw Jesus and screamed and was asking Jesus, Lord, will there not be mercy and forgiveness for me again? Right there, the two angels called me and said to me, this man was a married man. This man had been a Christian and was traveling to a place through public transport. They, in the public transport, he met a lady and ended up committing adultery with the lady in the hotel and died after the act. And he was now asking for mercy and forgiveness from Jesus. And Jesus turned to him. This was what the angels told him. Jesus turned to him and told him, when that young lady was seducing you, I was aware of it. I gave you grace, sufficient grace to overcome. And my spirit was warning you, son, don't commit that evil. But because you were overcome by lust, despite my warning, you went ahead 
and committed that for that adultery. This city of heaven is too holy to accommodate you. Here in this city of heaven, the Father is holy, the Son is holy, the Spirit is holy, the angels are holy, the saints are holy. All living creatures are holy in heaven. And above that, heaven has been dedicated unto holy living. Therefore, nothing that is defiled shall ever enter into heaven. Oh, what a loss. The angels at the gate beckoned at me, and I came to the gate. The book of life was opened, and he placed his finger on a particular spot and said, In the morning of today, this man's name was written in the book of life. But as you can see in the evening, the man's name had been removed from the book of life. And I saw where the man's name was written, and I saw where the man's name had been removed from the book of life. And as that man was standing and asking Jesus for mercy and forgiveness, Jesus told him that it's too late. He was asking for a second chance. And Jesus told him it is too late. Jesus told him, in this place, God the Father has given him this place as an inheritance. And that it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment of God. Jesus told him that mercy is only obtainable in the world. Once you die and cross over to the other side, there's no more mercy. While this man was pleading and we were see, watching him, a mighty force came and took him off his feet. And I fixed my eyes on this man. And this man went to hell. What a loss. What a loss for eternity. This is for eternity. Friend, I want to counsel you today. A lot of people commit adultery. They call it fun. A lot of people commit sin. They drink it like water. A lot of people don't bother about God. If you lose your soul in eternity, it's going to be forever and ever. Why were we standing at the gates of heaven? A preacher died and was coming towards the gates of heaven, the judgment gate of heaven. When he got to the gates of heaven and wanted to step on the shore and step into the city, the angel shouted, Stop! And he was frightened and he stopped. And Jesus went closer to him. Jesus said to him, When I saved you from your sin, I gave you a robe and a garment of righteousness and holiness of life. And I warned you against defiling this garment. Look at the stain on your garment. And the man began to look at himself. Jesus assisted him and pointed somewhere around his chest side and said, See the stain on this garment. This garment was not the garment I gave you. Your garment had been defiled. And the man went to hell. On an account of one sin, the man went to hell. Hell is not a place to be. What a beautiful city it is in heaven. As I stood at the pearly gates of heaven, I had automatic joy. I, I had an excitement that I cannot explain. Five minutes in heaven, you will forget all your sorrows, all your troubles, all your tribulations on earth. But five minutes in hell is like for eternity. Now, we stepped into this, outside the city of heaven, we were having, I was hearing some songs of joy, melodious songs. Songs of glory, angels, voice of angels. But the moment we stepped into heaven, heaven became so quiet. You know why? The king of the kingdom had arrived. Because God gave Jesus a name, a name above every other name. And that at the mention of that name, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus is Lord. When we stepped into heaven, I saw we walked on the streets of gold. These streets are made up of gold. You could see that in the scripture of Revelation 21. 
the streets of heaven are made up of gold. We also saw flowers well arranged by the side of the road. And as the music in heaven is such that it's so wonderful. Every part of heaven I went with Jesus, I was hearing the sound of those music. And the flowers were dancing according to the rhythm of the music. This is significant in heaven because heaven is a beautiful place. It is a place you need to be. It's a place you need to go. It's a place you can give up millions of your walls to be there. And then we walked on the streets of gold. I saw, I saw myriads of angels who were coming out to welcome Jesus into the pearly city of heaven, pearly gate, from the pearly gates of heaven. And then the Lord, the angels led me to the throne room of God. When we go to that throne room, I saw nothing there. But what I saw was a mountain of light. It's called like a condensed cloud, like a mountain of light. What you see there is just light shining in full intensity. And then I saw angels around it. Then I heard a voice coming out. And it was a voice of Jesus. And then the Lord stepped out of it, took me to a small river in heaven and stood beside that river and told me and said, this is the river of the water of life. And I was expecting him to say, to have a follow-up statement to what he has said because the Lord was a bit higher, I mean taller than myself. Suddenly, I heard him sobbing and weeping. Now, why does Jesus weep? The Lord stood beside that river and told me, My son, brother Mike, do you know that I love man with an everlasting love? When I created man, I created man in my image and after my likeness. As the Lord wept, although I didn't know why he was weeping before he asked me that question, I joined him to weep because I couldn't hold back my tears when I saw the Lord Jesus who wept. Do you know Jesus is weeping for you? When I created the world, I created man in my image and after my likeness. I did not create any other creature like unto myself except man because I have an everlasting love for man. When I created man, there was no life in him, but because of the everlasting love I have for man, I breathed my life into man, and man became a living soul. And I clothed man with all my natures and attributes. I gave man authority and dominion over all the things I created. Why? Because I have an everlasting love for man. I did not create any other creature like unto myself except man, because of the everlasting love I have for man. But man sinned against me. Man went against my commandment. It was like man slapped me on my face and I was wounded in my heart. But because of the everlasting love I have for man, I made a promise with immediate effect to bring man, to restore man back onto myself because I have an everlasting love for man. I made a promise with immediate effect. That was the promise of the Son of Jesus, I mean, the Son of God, the Messiah, that was going to come to the world and bruise the head of the serpent, while the serpent will bruise his heel. And then Jesus now said, Because of the love I have for man, I made a promise with immediate effect to restore man back unto myself because I have everlasting love for man. Yet man became so wicked on the earth that the imaginations and the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And I said, my spirit shall not continue to strive with the spirit of man. In my wrath and anger, I wiped out that generation. Yet because of the everlasting love I have for man, I sent them Moses. I anointed my servant Moses. I put my law, I gave my law to Moses to give to man. And I put my spirit upon him to restore man back unto myself. But they sinned against me more and more and rebelled against Moses. I also sent them kings, priests, and prophets. I also sent them Jeremiah and anointed my servant Jeremiah and I gave him my word to give to man. I also put my spirit upon him. But the people I love with everlasting love, the people I formed to show forth my praise, 
told my servant Jeremiah that as for the word God gave you to give to us, we will not do it. And Jesus screamed and said, man, Jesus said, man rejected me. Yet, because of the everlasting love I have for man, I came in a manger. I came in a humble way. I came to my own, my own rejected me. When I came into the world, I was beaten by mortal man. I was spat upon by mortal man. I was scorched and mocked. I was persecuted and ridiculed. At last, I went to the cross and I died. I died on the cross. And when Jesus said, I died on the cross, I was crucified and died. He showed me the picture of his crucifixion on the cross. He showed me his hand where he was nailed to the cross. And he showed me the nail, the wounds of the nail where he was nailed to the cross. He showed me his foot where he was nailed to the cross. And showed me his head, the crown of stone that was laid upon him. I saw that fresh crown of stone that was laid upon him. And I saw blood gushing out all over his head. And then he pointed to me. He said, see my side where I was pierced with a spear. And I saw blood coming out. And then he said, this fountain of my blood will continue to flow until the final day. I showed man everlasting love so that man can have everlasting life. Yet, man rejected my love. I showed man love, yet the best way man felt he could reward me for the love I showed for him was to, show, was to pay me back in wickedness, in rebellion, in stubbornness, and in disobedience. I showed man everlasting love so that man can have everlasting life, yet man rejected my everlasting love. Therefore, I will in return destroy man with my everlasting destruction. What are you still doing in sin? Because Jesus died to procure salvation for you. You have no reason why you should remain in sin when Christ has died for your own sin. Now, at that point, Jesus told me the situation of the church. And he took me to a place and said, I want to show you the condition of my church the bride of the Lamb. Jesus showed me the condition and the situation of the church. He took me beside a mansion and pointed his finger towards the earth and a door was opened in heaven and I looked and I saw a large auditorium filled to capacity and praises and worship was going on. Then I responded quickly to him. I said, Lord, your church is on fire. They are worshipping you in spirit and in truth, and they are expecting your eminent return. He screamed and said, no, look again, my son. When I looked the second time, I now saw that same auditorium that was filled to capacity. The people they were singing and praising God had chains on their hands. They have chains on their legs. Their legs were chained. And beside their legs, some of them have yoke of chain on their neck that bound them. They took heavy, some of them had heavy luggages of sin and their neck bended one side as if they need help. And many of them, their sins were written on their foreheads, naked on their foreheads. And Jesus looked and said to me, this is the condition of my church. This is the church I suffered for. This is the church I died for. My own church had become a place of bondage where all sorts of wickedness and evil were going on. Ministers of the gospel commit outright sin on the temple, on my holy mountain, and judgment will begin in the house of God. Ladies now dress to church to seduce people, and people now die and go from church to hell. A lot of evil and wickedness is being practiced in the church of God today. And the church is in bondage. And then I saw a very dark image moving up and down in the auditorium, beating his son on the chest in anger and boasting, saying very loudly, these are my people. I keep them in bondage here. 
They do not, they thought they are serving God, but they do not know they are under my bondage and I keep them busy here. Friends, are you busy in the church? Are you busy in the choir? Are you busy as an usher? Are you busy doing one thing or the other? And you're bound with pornography? You're bound with fornication and adultery? You're bound with masturbation and lesbianism? Some even go to the essence of committing bestiality, sleeping with animals, dogs, pets. Some have gone far, way far, and they are even using sex toys, dehumanizing themselves. And these people go to church, they sing in the choir, they speak in tongues, they pray prayer warriors, they prophesy. These are the sets of people Jesus said that I will say unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I want to ask you a question as a minister of the gospel. Are you a worker of iniquity? Are you a worker of righteousness or worker of iniquity? Jesus weeps for you. I'm praying that you will hear his voice today and you will repent and change your life in Jesus' name. Now, having told me the situation of the church, the present state of the church, Jesus spoke to me and said, my son, I have a program for the church. When I begin my program for the world and for the church, all programs of men, all programs of churches will cease. And he took me to another mansion that looks like a hall. It looks like an office. There we stood at the door of that hall, of that mansion. We saw both men, saints and angels walking like an office setting with files. They are walking with files. They had files, they have tables, they have chairs, and they are walking. And then you see saints and angels carrying fires in and out of that building. And there was a chart on one of the board on the wall. And Jesus pointed to me and said, my son, see my entire program for the church. And the only thing that is remaining on that chart is the imminent return of Jesus Christ in the rapture to rapture the saints. And Jesus said, that is the only thing that is remaining in his program for the world. The rapture of the saints which will take place any moment from now. Nobody knows the date of his coming, but that is going to take place any moment from now. And we've come to let you know. And Jesus took me on a tower. We went to a various street. We saw a lot of streets in heaven and mansions. When I mention mansions, I don't mean these common houses in the Western world, in America, in Europe, and other parts of the world. I'm talking about houses that are constructed and built with gold and precious stone. Gold is the commonest precious stone in heaven. That's why they use it to build roads. But there are other precious stones that are used to build heaven. And you will see those, found, those, 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 those stones very beautiful. Heaven is a beautiful place. I've traveled to some of the mega cities in the world. But I've not seen a place that has the peace and the love and the joy and the happiness of heaven. There's an excitement, there's a joy, there's a music, there's a song. God's choir, in fact, when I got to heaven, I was like asking the angels, I want to go to join the song. He said, no, that song you're hearing is a combined choir of angels and saints. They're singing to the glory of God. And when we were at the throne room of God, we saw some substances Substances coming out from a particular direction, white, coming out, and they were hanging. Although nothing is holding them, but they were hanging around the throne and were dangling according to the rhythm of the song. So I saw those substances flying to the throne, and I was asking questions. Praise and worship that was going on in heaven. Those was praise and worship, and the combined choir of angels and saints. So I asked the angel with me, I said, I want to join those people singing glory and adoration to God. The angel said, no, you're on assignment. So I asked him, what are those substances that are coming from that direction? Whitish, wonderful substances hanging at the throne room of God. The angel told me, he said, you see those praises and worship that is going on? They are coming as a sacrifice, as the fruit of the leaves of the people singing. It's a combined choir of angels and saints. You need to be in that choir. And they declined the request for me to go and join those songs in heaven. The Lord showed me a lot of those mansions. He said, I have finished preparing the mansion, but unfortunately, 
the bridegroom, the bride of the land. It's not yet ready for the coming of the bridegroom. That heaven has been prepared. Everything has been finished. Prepared, waiting. And while we were standing by the door of the mansion that looks like an office, I had a booming voice. When will our brethren come and meet us over here? And Jesus said, you can hear. The saints in heaven are preparing and waiting for the coming home of the saints. That everything is set in heaven. The only thing remaining is the rapture of the saints, which will bring the saints back home. The Lord took me back to the gates of heaven. When we got to the gates of heaven, I saw a preacher who died and was coming towards the gate of heaven. He was coming with so much excitement as if he wants to enter heaven. Then one of the angels shouted, stop! And he was frightened and he stopped. Then the Lord spoke to him concerning the state of his soul. The Lord spoke to him on the stained rope of righteousness which the Lord gave him. I gave you this rope and I warned you against defiling this garment. Now, part of the thing Jesus showed me in heaven, he said to me, people of the world said, how can fish swim inside a river and will not drink water? They do not believe that the blood I shed on the cross can set anyone who comes to me by faith from sin and from the power of sin. My blood that I shed on the cross can set anyone who comes to me by faith from sin and the power of sin. I will show you a living example of someone you knew when he was in the world who had died and have come to heaven to prove to you that a young man like you can serve me in this world and can come to heaven in holiness and righteousness. So he took me to a mansion. We got to that mansion. Suddenly, I saw one of my late friends. We went to the same high school and the same polytechnic. Although he was my senior, he was the president of the Fellowship of Christian Students while I was in the high school. Brother John Lambert is his name. He came out of that mansion and in excitement wanted to hug me. The Lord said to him, no. He's on assignment. He's going back to the world. That was the first time I heard that I'm going back to the world. I shall be going back to the world. So the Lord stood there with my friend with a big smile and a crown on his head and a white robe. My friend was a very poor person on the earth. He had nothing. While we were in school, in the high court, in the, in the polytechnic, he cannot afford food, even school fees. But we lived together in the same room, slept on the same bed, ate the same food, did everything in common. Sometimes when I go to market to buy stuff for myself, for clothes and anything, I buy, for, I buy with him. I buy for him too. So, he died on November 7, 2001. I didn't know he died. I just came to visit him where he was working because he, was, he tried to work before he raised some money to go to high institution, to university, for university degree, degree education, education. And then, I got to that school to look for him, to greet him when I came to the city. I asked of him, they told me that, oh, yeah, you've not heard what happened to your friend? I said, what happened? They said, your friend died on November 7th. It was a brief illness. After he died, they couldn't keep his corpse on the much, in the mortuary. They took him immediately to bury because there was nobody that wanted to be responsible for the bees of the mortuary. He was buried immediately he died that same day. Transported his corpse to the village and then he was buried. And I didn't know. When I came to look for him in that school, I was told he had died. But he lived a very wonderful Christian life. We were friends. We grew up together. We lived together in the same room while in the hostel. He lived a wonderful Christian life. He walked worthy of the vocation in which God called him. And I was surprised when I got to heaven 2003, I saw my friend in the glory of heaven. Nobody can tell my friend to come back to the earth and you will agree because I wish I were like him because for him, he has gone to heaven finally. No more temptation, no more prayer, no more reading the Bible, no more anything. He is now enjoying the glory of God in heaven forever and ever. So Jesus told me, he said, 
if anybody wants to go to heaven, I will give him sufficient grace to go to heaven. But if someone wants to go to hell, Satan can sponsor support for the person to go to hell. Again, the Lord said, I'm going to show you something again. The Lord took me to a mansion and asked me a question. I said, do you know sister so-and-so in so-so church? I said, yes. He said, that sister is my servant. There is a crown that is waiting for her. When you go back, encourage her. He mentioned about names of so many pastors to me. Some of them I know them, some I don't know them. Some of them were very close to me and told me to give them personal messages to go and encourage them. One of them was passing through persecution from his church. He was keeping to the standard, was emphasizing truth, holiness, and righteousness. But the church wasn't supporting him preaching that gospel. So the Lord sent me to him to tell him he's aware of what he's going through. He knows what he's passing through. Even though the leaders in the church don't support the gospel he preached, among the young people he was leading. But the Lord asked me to encourage him to tell him that he has taken notice of what the good work he's doing among the people. He should keep on doing the good work and the Lord is going to reward them. So a lot of people, catalogs of people, the Lord mentioned their names to me, telling me, these are my servants. They're doing my work. Go and encourage them. And I did. I've related all the messages to many of them. Now, he took me to a, a mighty hall. When we got to the door of that hall, the gate of that hall, I saw crowns, crowns of different sizes. Some were big, some were medium, some were small. And these crowns were arranged layer by layer. As far as my eyes could see before me by the side, it's a mighty hall. And those crowns are glittering. And the Lord said, these crowns are for the faithful and the overcomers who overcome flesh, the world, and the devil. These crowns shall be given unto them. These crowns are for the faithful ones, I repeat again, who overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil. These crowns shall be given unto them. At that point, the Lord said to me, Now, my son, when you go back to the world, go and tell man I still love him. Tell him my message of everlasting love to him. Tell him truth, righteousness, holiness. If man wants to come to heaven, he must be truthful, he must be righteous, he must be holy. Now, this experience and encounter with Jesus happened three consecutive times. All the three times my trip to heaven and to hell, the Lord brought me to heaven, took me to hell. The second trip, he brought me to heaven, took me to hell. The third trip, he brought me to heaven, took me to hell. This is the brief summary of the testimony of my three divine supernatural visits to heaven and to hell. And the details are contained in this book titled Divine Revelation of God's Holiness and Judgment, an account of three supernatural visits to heaven and to hell by Michael Thomas Sambo. Thank you.